Hello, everyone. Today, we explore a compelling new article by Dr. Turki Faisal al Rashid, published in Arab News, titled Harmonizing Heritage Innovation in Dariya's Oases. Through the lens of Wadi Hanifa and the Dariya Global Seminar 2025, the article reveals how ancient oases are shaping modern sustainability, where heritage becomes a roadmap for Saudi Arabia's vision 2030. Author Introduction Dr. Al Rashid is a Saudi businessman, academic, and thought leader, an adjunct professor at the University of Arizona, and founder of Golden Grass Inc. His work bridges tradition and progress, shaping a resilient vision for the future. Stay with us as we dive in. Okay, let's unpack this. We're diving into a concept that uh, really turns traditional sustainability on its head. It really does. When you think about climate solutions, you probably picture, you know, electric cars or these massive solar farms, right? Sure, the big tech stuff. Exactly. But for this deep dive, we're looking at how ancient oases, we're talking hundreds, even thousands of years old, are being used as the literal blueprints for tomorrow's sustainable world. And this is happening in Saudi Arabia. Yeah. What's fascinating here is that this isn't just, you know, a historical curiosity. Right. This entire deep dive is built around insights from the Diria Global Seminar 2025. It just took place in Diria, and the theme was sustaining civilizations, oases, and the continuity of heritage. So our mission is to analyze what came out of that gathering, specifically yeah. focusing on how this deep, rich legacy of oases, particularly the 120 kilometer lifeline of Wadi Hanifa, mm -hmm. how that translates into tangible forward looking strategies that feed into Saudi Vision 2030. Exactly. The core concept the seminar pushed is that oases are not just relief points in the desert, not just a place to stop for water. Right. They define them as engines of endurance. We're shifting the perspective to see them as these complex, integrated systems. So what does that mean? What are the pillars? Well, it means looking at three things. The ecological systems, the um, ancient architectural ingenuity, and then the intangible heritage. And the idea is to show how that three-part understanding is actively driving cutting-edge innovation today. I really appreciate that distinction. Moving past seeing these places as just beautiful historical relics and, you know, recognizing them as living functional models. And that recognition is the absolute foundation of the current strategy. As one of the key speakers, Prince Sal bin Talal bin Badir noted, he said, nature has always shaped our identity from the banks of Wadi Hanifa to the expansive oases that mirror our resilience. So it's not just rhetoric. Not at all. The past is literally structuring the future. Okay, let's dive into that past then. If Wadi Hanifa is the blueprint, we need to understand the original design. It's known as the ancient heart of Diria. Can you can you sort of paint a picture of its geography? Certainly. This valley is this incredible environmental contradiction. It starts high up on the Najed Plateau and stretches southeast, basically acting as this massive channel for seasonal rainfall. Winding its way down toward the empty quarter. Exactly, toward the Rob al -Kali. For millennia, this waterway, sometimes just a trickle, other times a raging torrent, was the most reliable source of life in the entire Central Arabian Peninsula. And that geography just dictates everything, right? If you're reliant on flash floods or groundwater in that region, managing it is the difference between life and death, civilization or collapse. Precisely. We have archaeological findings that suggest settlements have been thriving here for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. We know that the Banu Hanifa tribe their very name speaks to water purity. They didn't just survive here. They prospered. They prospered. They tilled the fertile soil and were key traders, moving incredibly valuable goods like amber grace and frankincense, using the valley as a sheltered, water-rich route. And then fast forward to the 18th century and the political gravity shifts entirely to this valley. It absolutely does. Wadi Hanifa became the undisputed nucleus of the first Saudi state. This is where Imam Muhammad ibn Saud established his power base and forged those key alliances. And the water itself become a symbol. A symbol of sustenance, yes, but also sovereignty, stability. To control the water was to control the future. Which brings us to the technological marvel of the time. You mentioned the Falar systems, wait, subterranean. How complex were these and why underground instead of just using open channels? That's the key question, and it defines their sophistication. The Falage are uh, ancient irrigation networks, essentially underground aqueducts, all built by hand. They channeled groundwater from springs or aquifers with this incredibly gentle, almost gravity-defying slope. So it's all about precision. All about the precision of the angle. 
allowing water to flow for dozens of kilometers to the fields without any pumps. So why underground? Two crucial reasons, and this shows their deep environmental knowledge. First, by keeping the water subterranean, they drastically reduced evaporation in that intense desert heat. Makes sense. Second, it protected the channels from flash floods and you know external contaminants. This allowed them to irrigate vast orchards, date palms, wheat, barley, and support a population that swelled to tens of thousands. It's early water engineering, but with an eye toward ultimate sustainability. In an arid land, yes. It's oh. remarkable. And the result wasn't just human habitation, but a huge ecological success story. The sources describe Wadi Hanifa as a major biodiversity hotspot. It was a rare microclimate for the peninsula. Even today, despite all the challenges, it hosts Arabian leopards, hyraxes, and over 200 bird species. It was a genuine green respite. And that rich history is what makes it so relevant today. Right. The ingenuity of the foliage, the resilience of the ecosystem, it shows that the capacity to harmonize nature with human ambition is built right into the identity of the place. It sounds like the Wadi was thriving, a perfect ancient system. But as with all success stories, prosperity often brings new, unforeseen challenges. Let's fast forward to the mid-20th century when this incredible microclimate faced an existential threat. What happened when rapid urbanization hit? The change was just devastating, and it happened fast. In the 1970s, as Riyadh experienced this phenomenal oil-fueled growth, this massive urban sprawl, the ancient system just broke down. So the wadi was no longer revered. It became a convenient open-air dump. Untreated effluent sewage refuse. Yeah. It all clogged its natural flow, eroded the soils, and just fundamentally poisoned the native flora. So it turned a natural resource into an environmental liability. Absolutely. And the consequences were immediate and long-lasting. All that dumping and extraction meant groundwater depletion rates in the Riyadh Basin started exceeding two meters annually in some areas. Two meters a year. Yeah. It rapidly exacerbated water scarcity and led to extensive soil salinization, making the remaining agricultural land unproductive. It's a tragic, but, you know, a classic tension of that era. Economic prosperity fueled unchecked expansion that just cannibalized the very resource it was that, built on. Exactly. That degradation must have been a powerful visual warning sign. What was the catalyst that finally flipped the script? That environmental crisis launched the uh, the visionary Wadi Hanifa Comprehensive Development Program in 2001. Right. This was a colossal effort spearheaded by what was then the Riyadh Development Authority, now the Royal Commission for Riyadh City, working with global firms like Borough Hepold and Moriyama and Teshima. Okay, so let's talk about that restoration because it really is a phoenix-like story, mm. going from a poison sewer to a showcase for ecological urbanism. What was the scope of that $200 million project? The scope was breathtaking and deeply integrated. They didn't just clean it up, they engineered a living, resilient system. The program restored 85 kilometers of the valley. 85 kilometers. Planted 500,000 trees, many of them native species, to rebuild that microclimate, rehabilitated wetlands, and constructed a series of weirs. And these weirs weren't just for flow control. They were designed specifically for purification. So it was a total system redesign focused on sustainable water management. Precisely. And that's why it earned the prestigious Aga Khan Award for Architecture in 2010. It was recognized for turning this degraded scar into a model of ecological urbanism. And the results are quantifiable. Oh, yeah. Bird populations, a key environmental indicator, have rebounded by 40%. They also created boardwalks, interpretive centers, ensuring the infrastructure itself educates visitors on the lessons learned from that crisis. This successful, localized, heritage-led triumph is the perfect springboard for the national discussion. How does this hyper-local success translate into the vast goals of Saudi Vision 2030? It creates a foundational philosophy. The message from the seminar was clear. Oases are now seen as vital engines for development. It shows that sustainability doesn't have to mean entirely new infrastructure. It can mean enhancing what you already have. And this is why the kingdom is executing such a major green pivot, backed by truly staggering capital. Staggering is the right word. Give us some of those figures again, because they are massive. We're looking at green finance issuances surging to $12 billion in 2025 alone, commanding two-thirds of the regional market. But the scale of commitment, I mean, the investment minister has pledged $1 trillion toward green infrastructure to get to net zero by 2060. One trillion dollars. That is an ecosystem shift. That scale means this isn't just a government initiative. No way. 
It has to involve private partnerships, industry transformation. The strategy blends the circular carbon economy with about $500 billion in private sector infusions. And this capital is fueling a serious renewables renaissance. You see it in things like the 2.8 gigawatt solar partnership with Bahrain, aiming to reduce fossil reliance by 15% across borders. And domestically, projects like the 1.5 GigaW Sudair Solar PV project, which is already online. All of this feeds into the Saudi Green Initiative, the SGI. So for listeners, what are the crystal clear numerical goals of the SGI? The SGI is the roadmap. The goals are ambitious. 278 million tons of annual CO2 reductions by 2030. A monumental afforestation target of 10 billion trees across the kingdom. 10 billion? And establishing carbon capture hubs designed to capture 44 million tons of CO2 a year by 2035. What's fascinating is how that incredible technological investment is rooted right back in the ancient landscape of the Wadis. It's not just importing tech, they're blending it with tradition in a concept you called heritage as future. It's an intentional fusion. In pilot projects around Diria, for instance, they're using smart sensors to monitor aquifer levels in real time. It's like giving the ancient Fowler systems a digital brain to predict drought risks. Wow. They're also doing agroforestry experiments, blending native species like the drought-resistant cedar tree with stable crops. And this has demonstrably boosted yields by 30% while also sequestering more carbon. As a speaker at the seminar put it, these are not relics. They are roadmaps for resilience in a warming world. That is a compelling narrative, but we need to provide that balanced perspective. This green transition is facing some formidable headwinds. The sources caution that the road ahead is anything but smooth. Oh, absolutely. The major challenge is navigating financial and regulatory inertia. Hydrocarbon dependency still accounts for, what, 40% of the GDP? A huge number. It's difficult to pivot an economy that size. Plus, you have volatile oil prices straining the budgets needed for these ambitious programs. And the most immediate, practical issue, the central tension of the entire thing, is water scarcity. Greening efforts demand vast irrigation volumes in a nation where per capita water availability has plummeted by 80% since the 70s. It sounds like an impossible contradiction. How do you square that circle? Huge green goals in a desert nation that can't afford to run out of water? Well, that tension is where the strategy becomes critical. Environmental NGOs caution that over-relying on desalination, which is energy intensive and creates brine pollution risks, coastal ecosystems. So what's the strategic counter? They're leaning hard into what's called adaptive management, taking the lessons from Wadi Hanefa and applying them nationally. For example, they saw the vulnerability of those ancient Falash systems to climate-induced drought. Right. Now, the Comprehensive Development Program is incorporating AI-driven predictive modeling to digitally protect that traditional infrastructure by anticipating water stress. So they're using 21st century tech to ensure the survival of well, much older engineering. And on the afforestation front, how are they hitting those tree targets in such a dry climate? It comes down to focused investment in tech. Yeah. The SGI's $3.2 billion national tree planting program boasts an 85% survival rate. That's incredibly high. It is, because they're using advanced drip systems, hydrogel, and specialized soil amendments. Mm -hmm. Plus, regional PACs, like the Middle East Green Initiative, are fostering knowledge sharing on these very issues. And the results are becoming tangible in cities, too. Absolutely. Strategic shading and green infrastructure in Riyadh have led to a verifiable 20% drop in localized urban temperatures. Immediate measurable relief. All of this innovation seems to culminate in the Daria Master Plan, which is framed as the ultimate synthesis of heritage, restoration, and human-centric innovation. This is the city built with the Wadi, not on it. That $63 billion, 14 square kilometers City of Earth Master Plan is designed to plant 6.5 million native species right along the restored Wadi Hanifa. The philosophy is key. We are not building on the Wadi. We are building with it. And that philosophy translates directly into the architecture. They're using Adobe-inspired residences, drawing on the traditional Najdi style, but with modern features like passive cooling and rainwater harvesting. And AI-monitored biodiversity corridors. The integration is so deep that ambient temperatures are actively cooled by 5 degrees Celsius along the shaded escarpment trails. It's a human-centric approach with broader implications, moving beyond domestic success into a kind of global soft power play. That's a good way to put it. By rehabilitating wadis and championing oases, the kingdom is positioning itself as a bridge between ancient wisdom and cutting-edge climate tech. It's also innovating equity, a detail I find particularly compelling. 
Women-led cooperatives in Duria's oases now manage foulage maintenance. Which blends tradition with economic empowerment in a truly profound way. Yeah. It speaks to the stewardship model, giving the heritage back to the community. And while some observers might raise questions about greenwashing, the verifiable metrics provide a strong counter-argument. For example. For example, the SGI's marine protections have safeguarded 30% of territorial waters, earning accolades from UN bodies. The progress is measurable and tangible across multiple sectors. So what's the core takeaway for you, our listener? Our deep dive shows that sustaining civilizations, especially in fragile environments like the desert, requires intentionally connecting cultural identity. Like those ancient phalage systems and local folklore. With radical technological transformation, like AI and green hydrogen. It's the ultimate lesson in leveraging hyperlocal wisdom to solve global problems. The seminar's final call was a powerful summation of this. The question isn't just about survival in the desert, but how this heritage-led approach can redefine global resilience for all of us. A perfect thought to leave you with straight from the source material and building on everything we've explored today. Consider how your own local historical landscapes, your rivers, your coastlines, your forgotten systems, might hold their own roadmaps for resilience in a warming world, linking your cultural heritage directly to future sustainability. Because the final question posed by those guiding this transformation is, Will you join us in this green transformation? Together, we can forge a legacy that reveres our oasis whispers while quenching tomorrow's thirst, acknowledging the storms, but charting the stars. Conclusion As we conclude this discussion, we return to the vision expressed by Dr. Turkey Faisal al-Rashid, a vision grounded in clarity, innovation, and a deep commitment to building a more stable and interconnected future. For the full article, you'll find the link in the description below or you can visit Arab News at www.arabnews.com. A complete overview of the Daria Global Seminar 2025 is also available through the link in the description. To learn more about the author and his work, visit www.tfrashid.org. If this video sparked new ideas or insights, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more conversations like this. Thank you for watching. Stay informed, stay curious, and we'll see you in the next video.